Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning to everyone. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Chris Dice or Cedar Boss Ring. Hi, Chris. Good morning. All right. It's uh, it is 1001. For those of you that were on, I said we'd start just a little bit late today. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and especially um, lift up a prayer for those that are already there or those that are headed to L.A. for that big Triple uh, E entertainment event. I know there's a number that are in transit, so we need to hope and pray everybody's safe in the midst of the storms that are going on there. Uh, you heard uh, Britt mention at the beginning, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and there we, we will share a link to the webinar recording along with the presentation slides uh, sometime after the meeting. So uh, if you have to leave and, and hop back on or, or miss it for something else, you can always come back and, and catch all that. Uh, it's going to be a great day because we're going to have some tremendous guest speakers that are going to present on Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. ARPA-H, uh, with a focus on customer experience, the, the customer experience hub. And as always, we remind uh, the board, guest speakers, uh, that their presentations tie back to the goals and economic development roadmap that the region outlined in the SEDS. So uh, it's very consistent to have them here to present to us. For any guests that join our meeting, we encourage you to use the chat feature, please, if you would, for any questions or comments uh, that you have during the meeting. Jerry Watson, a COG staff member, will be monitoring the chat and prompting Pritt or one of the other of us, others of us to make sure and ensure that your question is asked. The, uh, the Zoom webinar will provide us with a record of board attendance, so we won't be taking attendance. So uh, we can get right on uh, with what we need to do today. The first item of business, though, is, to, is a recognition of service. And I'm not sure I'm looking across the room. I don't know that Dr. Maria Martinez Cosio is on. Uh, if, uh, if she does join here later, certainly we want to make sure and applaud her. Her role at UTA has been shifted somewhat, and she has been uh, gracious enough to open up her seat for another education and education professional to fill her current spot. But we just want to thank uh, Dr. Martinez Cosio for her service to North Central Texas and economic development and, and thank her for bringing her higher education expertise to the conversation and to be a voice for the, the higher ed community. So uh, thank the world of her, have gotten the, the pleasure of working with her and, and uh, certainly look forward to whomever else we get on. Print. So uh, if, you, if you know Dr. Martinez Cosio, make sure and send her a note of thanks or tell her the next time you see her, if you would, everybody. All right, let's do this. Let's turn to item three, the approval of the November 6th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Does anybody have an item of concern you want to raise or any kind of uh, amendment that needs to be addressed? If, if not, I'll move, I'll move to accept. Excellent, Jeff. Thank you. Can I get a second? Jeanette will second. Yeah, thanks, Jeanette. All right, unless there's any... Uh, Concerns, we'll just uh, accept them by acclamation and move forward. Thank you. As I mentioned at the start, we've got guest presenters. Uh, Pritt was great to send you the uh, speaker's bios, sent some out to the board last week, and hopefully you've gotten a chance to read about the individuals we have here. Uh, we're going to have the Advanced Technology International ATI uh, present. They serve as, a, as the consortium manager for the ARPA-H, Customer Experience Hub. And they're here to present to us today. Uh, we want to put a special thanks before they do, though, to board member Ben McGill for connecting us to ATI. And we all look forward to hearing about ARPA-H and the Customer Experience Hub, and, and in particular, the economic growth and workforce development impacts that we anticipate across the North Central region and beyond. Uh, I'm going to hand the ball over, I believe, to uh, Dr. Mike Stebbins and uh, he and uh, Grayson Door and Jenny, I'm going to probably, I'm going to save the pronunciation. I'll make sure I say it right. I don't know. I'll leave that. Uh, I'll leave that to, uh, to Mike, but uh, welcome to all of you. And thank you for your willingness to come present to all of us today on a, on a critically important topic for our region. Thank you, Marty. This is Grayson Door. I know Mike's uh, joining us. I'll, 
I'll do a brief intro. You did such a great job of laying out uh, the framework uh, for who we are, but I'll just say a few things and then turn it over to Mike. But uh, we want to extend our appreciation and thanks, as you already mentioned, uh, to Benjamin and McGill in our connection with Lily Carp and, and many of you know with Lida Hill Philanthropy. So thank you to that. Um, we were excited when we heard about this opportunity, uh, what seems like many months ago, but uh, in November timeframe of last year and connecting with Crit. Uh, and, and hearing more about uh, this board in the North Central Texas uh, Economic Development Region. Um, today, we're here to emphasize really uh, the value that ARPA-H and the Customer Experience Hub not only plays in Dallas, Arlington, Fort Worth region, uh, but more importantly, the overall impact to the state of Texas and our country as we continue to build out our, our spoke network. So today we're just over 300 spokes uh, with headquarters in 40 states. Uh, that is a rapid growth considering we just launched in the middle of October, uh, but we are continuously actively recruiting spokes. And when we say spokes, you can use that interchangeably as members in this network. And so as the, the CMF or consortium management firm for ARPA-H and this customer experience hub, we we hope to continue and prove that value of building out this uh, nationwide network. So again, before I turn it over to Mike, I just, again, wanted to emphasize our sincere appreciation for the work that you do in the region and state. In the end, we all know we all have a strong passion uh, towards improving the quality of life for our streets, our towns, our cities, our communities. And I challenge each of you and myself included as we walk through this, to not only just think about your region, but how this can impact initiative across the nation. So thank you again. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Grayson, thanks. Um, appreciate that uh, quick overview. Uh, Marty, uh, thank you for having us. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with the North Central Texas Economic Development uh, District Board. Um, and, and I'll echo a couple comments Grayson made. Um, it's really, important to understand what opportunities are out there and, and to understand the role each of um, each of you companies you represent the districts that you represent uh, can play you know ati we're we're not a technology developer but we we facilitate technology development primarily for the federal government and um it, it's really important to understand the power of networks and we feel that one of the primary roles we play as a consortium management firm is is convening the right parties to address grand challenges um, this may be one of the grandest challenges we've undertaken uh, in, in our role we're, we're typically a little bit more focused on uh, um, let's say th thinner uh, tech, uh, technology verticals, <laughs> you might want to say, um, from medical countermeasures to uh, shipbuilding, cost reduction, uh, to armaments development. Um, but when you talk about health care, and in particular, improving health outcomes across the entire country, that's an expansive problem to solve. It's an important problem to solve. And when you think about reaching into disparate and um, hard to reach populations and understanding their voice uh the entities that are needed to to create the network uh and then to affect the network into into outcomes is uh, a tremendous challenge so so with that thank you for having us we'll make this short and sweet uh agenda is really high level we'll talk a moment about arpa h and what their uh, objectives are uh, we'll then neck down into where the customer experience hub uh, that that we were on uh, uh, plays uh, a role in ARPA-H's mission. Uh, we'll talk about, as, as Grayson spoke, spokes or members, uh, eligibility and benefits, and then uh, a brief touch on the application. Uh, we'll get into um, uh, the most recent initiative that was launched through the hub uh, about uh, advancing clinical trial readiness. And then we'll touch on uh, what we're terming immersive experience and ecosystem engagements. This is a sort of an ecosystem engagement in a sense. Uh, and then we'll just wrap up. So if we can go on to the next uh, slide. Um, I'm not going to I'm going to try not to read all of these uh, verbatim. I'm not a big fan of that, but uh, I, I sort of alluded to it already. ARPA-H 
if you are familiar with DARPA and their model, um, I mean, DARPA out of the Department of Defense effectively gave us the internet and a lot of other really incredibly um, transformational outcomes. Uh, ARPA-H is a similar construct, though uh, trying to be uh, unique, but it's all about health and it's really about improving health outcomes for everybody, um, all the way down to the societal uh, impact. So it's not just can we create a better clinical trial or can we create a better COVID vaccine? It is really trying to look at how do we understand truly the problem uh, all the way down to the personal level. And then at the end of the day, how do we take that problem, solve it from a technical standpoint, and then ensure the outcome survives in the wild. So it's great to create the next uh, drug delivery device, but if you can't get it in the hands of the, the right people, or if they can't use it effectively, then uh, the outcome is, is minimized um, to say the least. So uh, next slide. So a little bit about um, uh, President Biden's uh, vision. Uh, truly, this is a, a bipartisan effort. Um, honestly, as we start to come into, uh, we're halfway into the election cycle now. It seems like the election cycle starts up almost as soon as the, the prior election is done. I, I really look at this and think, you know, whether or not there's a change of administrations, this should be and I think it in all likelihood would be an, an effort that would transcend uh, partisan politics. Um, uh, President Biden was very wise in, in going after this in, in you know, 2022. How do we break that mold? How do we really fundamentally change uh, research and then commercialize it so that uh, we can solve and tackle uh, really big problems that become transformative? So if we can go on to the next slide. We'll look a little bit at the, the uh, ARPA-H health ecosystem, and, and really it's more than what you're seeing here, but it starts with the public. That's what I like about this slide the best, um, but there's aspects that really uh, touch, touch every sector. So if, uh, I'm going to go to the left. Uh, if you look at healthcare providers, patient groups, those aren't typically private investors, those aren't typically the ones we think about when we're thinking about solving a technical problem. We go, we go to industry, we go to academia, we understand what the, 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 the limitations are there and then put together a solicitation and, uh, from government and industry goes out and solves it. But if you don't understand that there's a large swath of the population that doesn't trust the healthcare market, that doesn't trust information that may be coming out from government or some other um, or some other uh, approving body, um, uh, much less feel like uh, the healthcare industry is really not taking their needs into account. Then you realize that this ecosystem is incredibly expansive and all the parties that are listed here, both from a customer standpoint and a performer standpoint, all of them are stakeholders and they have to be working synergistically to ensure that what comes out of ARPA-H truly is uh, transformative. So the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about how ARPA-H uh, plans to work uh, if we take a look at the, the program manager flywheel. So something that they did adopt from DARPA was bringing on board program managers or PMs. These are highly accomplished individuals, heavily credentialed, um, outside of the box thinkers. Uh, they come in with an idea. That's how they get hired. Uh, and then they're uh, to launch a program, maybe two or three over their time. Um, time might be three to six years, and then they're out the door. So they're not meant to be lifers uh, within the government system, but they come in with these grand challenges. And then really, how do they take that challenge and utilize the power of ARPA-H to, one, understand aspects of their challenge that they may not already know, and then turn that into a solicitation that can go out to industry for help in solving. And we'll talk about that in a moment when we get to the uh, ARP page uh, or, or to the uh, customer experience hub slide that's next. But but if you look at this flywheel, it's in continuous motion. Uh, at the end of the day, ARPA-H hopes to have 100 program managers. 
So if you can imagine 100 program managers, each with two to three, maybe four programs um, over three to six years, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of programs. Uh, that's one, a tremendous amount of dollar flow to solve those programs and a tremendous amount of, of opportunity, but there be, they'll be happening concurrently. And so we're at about 16 program managers, I think that are officially on board with ARPH now. Uh, their goal, honestly, by the end of calendar year 23 was 40. And so they're running a little bit slow there. But I mentioned that to not only talk about how program managers work within ARPH, but really to drive home uh, the vast amount of opportunity that's intended to come out of ARPH to solve these problems. So if we can go on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, what ARPH has termed their ARPANET-H network. Um, this is really meant to be a, a nationwide network, uh, an innovation network, where all of these ideas can come together, uh, innovators, institutions, peoples, uh, people, et cetera. And it's constructed right now of, of three regional hubs. Um, the customer experience, which is our hub, the investor catalyst, which is uh, headquartered up in the greater Boston area. And then really, I think it, I, I can't come up with a better phrase than the headquarters, the stakeholder and operations hub, which is in, in the DC area. But the customer experience and investor catalyst hubs were competitively sourced. Uh, and so we, uh, along with a, a huge team led by uh, Lida Hill, Tom uh, Luce and, and company, um, came together with ATI to go after and ultimately win the customer experience hub. Um, and we are literally in the process of developing this nationwide network of spokes or members. Uh, and again, you'll hear me say this on the next slide. It, it's really, it really is to bring that voice to the forefront. Uh, it's great to develop technology, but if you're not taking the end user's voice in mind from ideation all the way through creation, then um, the outcome that you're getting is not going to be truly transformative. So if we go on to the next slide, we'll get into uh, some of the ex specifics about the uh, customer experience hub. Um, and you see it right here, the words patient-centric um, really sums it all up. How do you understand what that population or any population is experiencing? Why do they have distrust? Why can't they get access to a clinical trial? Are they even aware of clinical trials? Do they have, um, do they have limited or no access to internet and therefore their ability to uh, gather information uh, is, is minimized? Do they live in a, a a very rural or a frontier like population, all of which exist within the state of Texas and their access to health care um, might be at best a first responder who could be a veterinarian that's coming out to the to the ranch to handle, uh, you know, a, a, a situation before they can get uh, taken to uh, true medical care. Um, and so it's really using a human centered design approach. And to do that, uh, we're deploying uh, individuals uh, throughout the region as well as, as nationally to understand um, and gain access to that customer experience. Um, we'll talk in a moment about uh, immersive experiences, but if you can imagine, um, if you can imagine almost any problem to solve that is within bounds for ARPA-H and the Customer Experience Hub. Um, and I, I think it's really incumbent upon us to, um, while solicitations and the ideas are going to come from the government out to industry, and I use that term broadly, it's really important as we onboard new members or new spokes to truly understand their capabilities and their capacity so that that information can be relayed in real time and accurately back up to the government so that they understand, do we even have the right capabilities out there to solve the problems that the program managers are, are envisioning? And then how do we in real time help the government become informed about those, those capabilities? So um, let's move on to the next slide. As Grayson mentioned, uh, this program is, is really quite new. <laughs> Uh, we went through the entire proposal process. It, it probably started in the February, March 
April timeframe. I went through an in-person pitch over the summer and then uh, full proposal and some negotiations. And ultimately, the award was inked right before the beginning of the current government fiscal year. So very late September. And then uh, in mid October, we officially launched the Customer Experience Hub in Dallas. So one of the um, constructs of this uh, network was that there is a physical nexus. Uh, so that is in Texas. Uh, it happens to be physically at Pegasus Park and um, um, in Dallas. And Grayson, do we want to go through the little video real quick? I'll I'll pause. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, I think we'll go through it and be right back. Okay, this is it. Hello, Texas. <laughs> it's so great to look around and see your smiling faces. The opportunity to launch ARPANET H today is incredibly exciting. This is a national hub and spoke ecosystem that spans all 50 states and over a thousand stakeholders. How do you glue all those pieces together in order to make it more than the sum of its parts? While the ARPA H Customer Experience Hub is anchored here at Pegasus Park in Dallas, we did have to have people be able to sit somewhere so they could share ideas and exchange information. But really those ideas and that information are being drawn from all across the country. And those programs and those dollars deployed are gonna be deployed back to all of those regional areas across the entire country. Healthcare access and affordability is a national crisis. Getting to some of those rural populations, underserved populations, underrepresented populations in terms of both access as well as clinical trial inclusion is something that we have to solve at a national level. But you've got to dig down into the local communities to really be able to be successful in expanding that reach and access. I think the challenge for us with ARPANET H is how do we understand individuals not only in the recruitment process and what the best fit is for them to participate in these innovations, but how do we support them so they're successful, we're successful, we can advance innovation and then bring that at scale. I was trained as a physician in Austria. I did a house calls with my dad in, in the city of Vienna. What does that mean, house calls? It means that healthcare comes to you, a concept that's gotten lost over the years. The goal and the idea here is, can we bring healthcare back to the patients where it has an impact and where people have an ability to take advantage of these solutions? Nothing exists like this out there. I love that the federal government has placed an investment out there that's gonna be the connector between private capital, between industry, between academia and researchers. It allows everybody in the ecosystem to really see what is happening to the patient, to get that experience, to feed it back in, and reinform all of those stakeholders. ARPA-H programs will generate new health solutions, which might be therapeutics, diagnostic tools, surgical interventions. The Customer Experience Hub is an ecosystem of experts in all of these areas who can test and evaluate these solutions. It's a way of providing guidance to improve programs mid-execution. I think ARPA-H is unique in that it pulls from both academics, but also from communities, as well as the venture capital world, industry, government, all working together to try to think about how do we transform this science from discovery out to practice. I'm personally excited about ARPA-H because I don't know how you can't be. To have a mission that is to have better outcomes for all Americans, I don't know how you don't raise your hand and say, can I be a part of that? And feel privileged to be a part of it, no matter how small or big that part is. ARPA-H and this Hub and Spoke Network have the ability to truly transform what we're doing at a national as well as local healthcare level. I think what happens next is going to be exciting, it's going to be visionary, it's going to be explosive, it will move fast, but it will truly make a difference in terms of the health of the American people. Okay, that, that, that's great. I'm not sure how you top that. Maybe we should have started there, but um, um, that, that really sums it up. Um, the individuals that uh, had a short speaking role in that really, I think, hit the, the true meaning of what we're trying to do with the customer experience hub, creating that network and reaching out into it um, to support ARPA-H and, and solving their, um, their grand challenges. 
So really there is no entity that is not eligible to become a member. Uh, we've got academia, institutions of higher education, certainly for-profit organizations, the large research organizations, uh, healthcare organizations, et cetera, um, small businesses, clinics, public health uh, and community health centers. We, we talked a little bit about payers and, and certainly patient advocacy groups. Uh, Community-based organizations, I think, are going to be uh, important here. And so to the degree that you all um, in your economic development role have access to these and can bring them to the forefront from an awareness standpoint um, it would, would be great. And um, you're certainly willing to, uh, you're able to share this, uh, the, the presentation, but uh, we're always available to come out and talk. But it, it really, it's it's creating a network out of your own network that's going to be important to um to 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 really make this thing work so we'll go to the next slide i'm not going to talk about benefits uh too much in depth but uh, i think to hit home from an economic development standpoint uh, it's really two things it, it's awareness and um of what's going on at arpa h but then just as importantly and i touched on this earlier it's awareness for the government of what the capabilities are within your community. Uh, and then the economic development aspects will follow. So as we have a better understanding in, in the, the North Central Texas and, and other communities, what's available, what are the um, up and coming biotech firms working on? What are the innovations that reside within those entities? Um, what is the access to hospital and uh, healthcare um, in, institutions as well as uh, community organizations that can really help our team understand the, the customer's voice. I think that's really where uh, where you will see the beginnings of what will be a, uh, uh, an important economic development activity. Uh, some of the, the benefits here are, are more related to once an entity has uh, <laughs> has a has a project on board and certainly that's the objective of all um, but I think it's it's starting and understanding where you play a role in the network that's that's really the most important. So if we can go on to the next slide, uh, you can use this QR code. You can certainly get onto our website. Uh, the application process is fairly benign. Uh, there's a bit of information about the entity it, itself that is wishing to join. Uh, and then the rest of the questions are really geared around understanding the capabilities of that entity and where they align with the mission spaces of ARPA-H so that some of that categorization can start at the very forefront. And then we can dive deeper into understanding the capabilities of, of each of the members. Uh, we vet those fairly heavily at ATI uh, before we send them on up to ARPA-H and then ARPA-H makes the final decision um, and as we say here, it really helps to get yourself categorized and, and this uh, the application walks you through that process. And then, of course, we have a team um, in both in Texas and in, in Charleston, South Carolina, that, that can help answer any questions uh, that you may have. OK, next slide. So real quickly, this is the first initiative that has come through the Customer Experience Hub. Uh, it's it's called the Actor Initiative. It's advancing clinical trial readiness. Um, and and honestly, this this was it it was quite fascinating to watch this unfold. So the concept here was um, understanding. Well, well, ultimately, the solicitation that will come out of this effort is all around how do we address really. Um, impactful and important aspects of clinical trial. How do we make them more accessible? How do we um, how do we make them quicker? How do we identify the populations that need to be part of the clinical trial, et cetera? And so and so we took the opportunity to almost immediately, while the the network was still nascent, and I might even say with 300 entities, it is still uh, very nascent uh, to dive into that network to understand immediately what they have already done in this space. So uh, there was 10, 11, 12 or so questions that were asked that really range from, are we asking the right questions? Have you done some of this before? Was it successful? Where did you find hurdles? Did you have challenges uh, either 
implementing this broadly or implementing it just within your institution and and quite a bit of other um, feedback was requested uh, that request went out for about five to six weeks um, and we received uh, about 151 forms that that came back in and you see some of the demographics here why that's important is 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 we then took that information along with the government uh, we sliced and diced it to get uh, to get specifics about uh, the demographics, uh, but the program manager that's responsible for this initiative is also looking at that data to understand how that data will help her reshape the solicitation that's ultimately coming out so that it's not reinventing the wheel um, and, and really taking into account who's done, uh, who's done work that's similar so that uh, we can go and, and, and get work done more quickly. Uh, and that will ultimately build out the final requirement uh, that will we think will come out shortly. In fact, I think we're on the, the, the cusp of, um, of, of feedback going back out to the network to understand how this process worked. And so we should see within the uh, coming weeks some information back out regarding the information that was received and then what the next steps are for uh, uh, for the broader network, uh, hopefully with a solicitation and uh, entities can start performing um, team. Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll ask, I answer the question real quickly about IP. Yeah, the government's really not interested in owning IP so that they can go out and, and compete with, with industry. Um, they may need uh, government purpose rights, et cetera, so that they, uh, you know, they've paid for the work ultimately and then they're, uh, but they're not looking to compete with industry. And so uh, there'll be a, a opportunity to negotiate intellectual property on a case-by-case -case basis. And we can go into that in a little more detail. But I want to, uh, I know I'm running probably a little bit long. Let's talk about immersive ex experiences on the next slide. And then I think we can wrap things up. And, um, you know, so there's, there's two last topics to really talk about these immersive experiences and then ecosystem trips. An immersive experience is really uh, opening up the, the mindset of the program manager. How can the program manager see something, whether related to their specific challenge that they're looking to solve or not, but where can they get out of the office, get out of the lab and understand a different perspective um, a different perspective than what they're used to. So uh, one of the examples I, I love to, to, to put out there is um, we had as a, a, a consultant working on our proposal, a former program manager from DARPA, and he was uh, in the neuroscience space and his immersive experience was actually flying in the cockpit of an F-16. And so just being able to witness and feel firsthand the G's created uh, as you take off, as you do tumble spins, et cetera, got him thinking in a different sense. How is that pilot controlling that, thinking through his, his uh, thought processes, et cetera? And so immersive experiences can be very detailed, uh, meaning specific to the, to the ask, like get into the lab and understand the clinical trials or go out into the rural populations and understand why it is difficult to um, pulse that population, why they cannot get into the city where the clinical trial is, et cetera, or they could just be more broad based. So we're asking all folks to think about what an immersive experience might be utilizing the assets in their area. Um, and then if we go to the next side, um, I mentioned that that this this call in a sense is like an ecosystem trip uh, we're also interested in going out to areas where we can understand the capabilities that are resident within that area so it could certainly be a webinar like this or in the case of what happened in, in november um grayson and, and some others within arpa h went out to denver uh, they engaged over 40 stakeholders uh they had a couple locations they had multiple topics where they convened some listening sessions uh, some panel discussions, et cetera, and then uh, an opportunity for prospective spokes uh, to come and talk about their capabilities. And um, that can be ha that can happen over a single day or a couple days. And it's a, really a great way to understand uh, what capabilities are resident within a geographical geographical area. So again, I I would implore 
spokes or prospective spokes or entities like uh, this board to think about how they might help put together an ecosystem trip. And that's another way to really think through economic development within your own, own organization. It really broadens the awareness, uh, not only for your members, but for the government to understand uh, what capabilities are resident. So the last slide coming up here is just simple information on how to contact us. Uh, you guys have all of this. Uh, we have an email address that everybody on our team uh, at ATI has access to. Uh, CustomerExperiencehub.org is our, um, our our website. We're on uh, X. We're on LinkedIn. And, um, and so I hope this was helpful to get a little bit of an overview of what the Customer Experience Hub is doing, what Opera H is doing uh, writ large. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Grayson. And uh, I appreciate uh, allowing us to take a little bit of time during your board meeting. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Mike. And I know um, Prit and I talked a little bit before. Um, I do have some questions um, I'll ask and, and make a few more introductions to our team to kind of get things started. And then we definitely wanna make sure we reserve the rest of the time. Uh, for you all to ask any specific questions. But before we do, like you've heard, uh, just just to clarify um, as questions come in, um, obviously we can speak um, on behalf of the Customer Experience Hub, but questions directly related to ARPA-H and funding and, and those sort of things, we can um, follow up with government on and see what information we can gather. So we don't wanna overspeak and, and misrepresent there. Um, but I do want to thank you all. I, um, I, I say I'm a re recovering e economic development professional. I spent the first half, maybe first half, we'll see what my wife says in my career, uh, working across the state of South Carolina in unique uh, facets, both from a utility standpoint and startup standpoint. And um, I very much saw through my career the, the, the mindset of a rising tide um, and, and collective work. Um, you know, oftentimes in your careers, you're preparing for certain site readiness or working on project X that nobody in the world knows what it is. Um, I think about late nights that I used to work on those projects and coming full circle to here uh, at the time under uh, Governor Haley's administration, uh, work that we did um, for certain projects later to be named Volvo and the impact that made in our region. And I think about the change that I hear through my local hardware stores of run-ins with uh, families and what that change meant for our region, but not only that for our state and much broader to that um, as recent announcements come out. But um, again, I know it's hard because we look at certain our own region and we want it to prosper, but um, currently today we're 85 or so spokes in Texas. Obviously that is the largest makeup of our network to date. Um, you know, we're, we're focused on Texas. That is the hub, uh, if you will or the headquarters and uh, we're, we're educating and, and recruiting and, and continuously and we still will do that. Um, but again, as a nationwide network, it's an, we've seen already firsthand the stories that are being told in different regions are very often the same with just different patient populations and demographics, right? And so whether we talk about engagement with ARPA-H, it's centering them on seeing and experiencing a region or a territory in the country they may not have, have gone to before and seen if their broad idea could be applicable to that patient population or demographic. So with that, again, thank you for your time. I'll kind of kick things off for us, Mike. I think uh, I do want to introduce uh, Jenny Ligon is on the call as well. She is our Texas, uh, all Texas ecosystem liaison for the customer experience hub. Uh, she is uh, based in our Pegasus Park office. Uh, although resides in College Park or College Station, so uh, covers a wide a wide uh, gamut for. And I see the thumbs coming up for College Station, so uh, she's on the call. Um, a few of the questions, and I'll just answer. I think I addressed one. Just how do how do you all stay engaged, right? So I posted in the chat uh, the link to join our mailing list. It's a quick form stack, so you can join that for the Customer Experience Hub. I'd also encourage you to stay inform on the ARPA-H side as well uh, to see some of these announcements coming down. And so, uh, again, you saw the last slide we have. We want to make sure you have the um, all the resources you need to stay informed and engaged uh, for that. So uh, a couple other questions. Jenny, I'll probably start with you and then, Mike, I got one for you, and then I'll turn it over to Pritt. Um, 
So Jenny, for you, what regional partners are you working with, universities, private sector, just kind of walk through maybe even what we what we were doing last week mm -hmm. um, highlight for the team, uh, for everyone to hear on the board. Absolutely. So happy to meet everyone. Thank you, Grayson and Mike. Excellent presentation. Um, as you can imagine, this being a nationwide effort, uh, we could do this nonstop every day and still not be able to tell our story to enough people. So um, we really appreciate the opportunity for it to, to come and visit with so many people at one time because you're all going to be advocates and be able to help us share that message. Um, you know, from an economic development standpoint and the roles that you perform, your network is the network we're looking for, right? We want to look for those institutes of higher education, the hospital systems, the community-based organizations, and, and really try to find the fit to where we could maybe utilize something that is a, a best practice that we've done with a combination with what Ben is doing at Dallas College and the EDA grant that he got and all of the components that are working with him, UT Southwestern, you know, taking those investments that the federal government has made showing how it's supporting workforce development and economic development to bring in new companies into the north texas region and then maybe saying this worked here this is the best practice we're going to go do this in indiana you know we're going to and it's going to focus on this particular aspect of the healthcare ecosystem and so um it really is and from my standpoint as ecosystem liaison if it sounds like it might fit shoot me an email i'll put my email address in the in the chat um you know, like Mike said, any really any institution could be a collaborator and a participant and, and a spoke member because we don't know where that next great idea is going to come from. You know, um, the programs to date are, you know, range from osteoarthritis and wound care and um, accessing, uh, utilizing artificial intelligence to support rural health care initiatives. But I mean, I'm sure we can imagine that there's going to be a lot of new things focused on aging and longevity cancer response components, I mean, childhood cancer and childhood disease, orphan disease, there's going to be a myriad of things that are going to be coming out with the, you know, again, like Mike said, we want another 83 program managers with two to three programs each. This is a lot of initiatives. So um, right now we're learning, we're growing together. Um, I've got, I know just enough to make me dangerous. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm in college station is because for the last 16 and a half years, I was with Texas A&M University System and did a lot with economic development and, and legislative affairs myself. So I got the big picture. I know what Texas is doing well, and I want to help use the Texas message to, to share with the rest of the United States and um, really grow kind of the benefits that we have in the medical center and with UT Southwestern and, and all of the major research and academic um, through commercialization components that we have here. So that was a very long-winded response, Grace, and I probably maybe didn't even give the example that you wanted, but um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and please feel free to reach out to me because um, I am your resource, so. No, Jenny, you covered, I mean, actually some of the other part too, like, I mean, I know, Crit, you had asked uh, us to kind of address um, the economic impact, workforce development impacts we see uh, from our perspective in the North Central Texas region. Um, like Jenny said, it's with all of these opportunities, and we, we heard from government last week, I mean, we start talking about program managers, again, acting as their own CEOs. When when the projects ultimately come, they're not looking for a response. They're looking for multiple responses, multiple shots on goal to where um, our members can respond, collaborate, and work together and very much move forward with those that not only have the most accurate, but the most timely submissions. And so it'll be a lot different than those who uh, work traditionally for, especially I came previously from the startup world, but more on the non-dilutive side where you're postmortemly working on uh, grants and SPR phase one, two, and zero. I mean, all of the above, this will be contract-based, milestone-based opportunities for uh, both large and small uh, organizations, hospital systems, all the way down to the two to three, you know, staff startup community uh, funded company to respond to. So I know it's a little speculative of what we could say the, the economic impact. I mean, I know historically, you know, we would love to sit here today and say, this is the average salary we see, the number of jobs that will be created, uh, capital access that will come into the state of Texas from other where, you know, otherwise outside. But, um, you know, you can kind of see what we've been informed from government side too. You know, each one of these program managers high level could have ultimately a 50 to $150 million budget for each of one of their initiatives, right? That's a range that they've given to the community when we were out uh, in Denver. And just think about that. And again, like Mike said, multiplying that over 
a hundred plus multiple programs throughout. So um, Jenny or Mike, anything you want to add to that before I turn it over to Prit as far as your thoughts on um, workforce development impacts or just impacts to the region? Uh, yeah, I, I, the only thing I'll add is, um, and I've, I know I've used this term quite a bit, is um, to me, economic development all starts with awareness. Um, you know, getting an understanding of what's available, the entities that reside in your regions, um, and and through a network like ARPH's Customer Experience Hub, not only will you have insight into uh, non-dilutive funding opportunities that are coming from the government, but you'll have a network you're building that could result in business-to-business -business interactions as well. Uh, the whole consortium model I've always felt is is more than just a conduit to non-dilutive funding. It's a it's a mechanism to get out there and and build your own network with uh, uh, entities that um, you know may need your specific technical advancements. Uh, they're looking for gap fillers. Um, or, you know, and then ultimately that becomes an opportunity for some of the smaller companies to possibly be an acquisition target if that's uh, of their best interest. So uh, there's a lot of ways to do economic development. I'm, I'm not one of those individuals. You, you guys know this hands down, but um, I feel like consortia and this network in particular, uh, if used right, can be another mechanism that um, you can deploy. And I, I agree on that, Mike. I think the it'd be fantastic if we got a $150 million um, funded program out of, you know, the DFW area, North Texas, whatever, right? It'd be fantastic to get 10 of those. Uh, the, the I think the real benefit, the true benefit to the 500 spokes that we'll have by the end of the fiscal year is the ability to get into a really um, detailed customer uh, management database to understand the capabilities that exist within the other spoke members. So you have an idea, you have a concept, you can reach out to your peer spoke member and you can identify opportunities to go after additional funding. You can put together a program that you want to maybe promote to ARPA H to, to, to be a next awarded program. So um, the network of networks is really kind of the, the theme here. Um, and, 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 and it is broad. ARPA H's mission is very broad, but I feel like from a, a workforce development standpoint, an economic development standpoint, if we do get a win, if we really do have an, it's it's easy, it's it's more tangible and it's more real than going to NIH or NSF because those are early stage research. Those are still you know bench scale research. This is really trying to take a concept and get it out to the market quicker, faster, uh, more cost effective. And so I I think in this realm, I think ARPA H is um, quite a unique brand new agency, and I encourage you all to go to their website and read up on them. Thank you so much. I know, uh, Britt, I'll hand the ball over to you. I see there's a couple of questions. Yeah, Marty um, and board, please feel free to unmute and ask questions if you'd like. If you're an attendee, feel free to post questions. I thank you all, but I'm, I'm going to leave it up to Marty and the board to maybe voice any questions or comments that you all have. Board members, any questions at all? Maybe as a seed planner, we did have one listener. I don't think it's a board member. Suzanne Hill had raised about who would own the IP of inventions or products that may generate out of this. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take the first stab at that Thank again. You. Um, you know, from an IP standpoint, of course, each program, each project, each contract will be unique. Um, not to get into the weeds with the acquisition pathway, but uh, the government intends to use other transactions as the acquisition vehicle as opposed to a FAR-based uh, agreement, certainly not going to be a grant um, or anything like that. But I, I, mentioned, I mentioned other transactions because they really allow quite a bit of flexibility with regards to, say, data rights, intellectual property, et cetera. And so on, on a case-by-case -case basis, I think those will be able to be negotiated 
again, the government is not looking to own IP so that they can go out and compete with industry. They just want to have access to the information that they, they need to have access to. And, and they are also interested in the most favorable IP terms for, uh, for the entity too. What you'll see uh, probably when a solicitation comes out is baseline entering IP terms and conditions. And from there, um, negotiation would happen. So it's really on a case by case basis is, is how I can say now, but I'm here to tell you, the government wants to make it easy to get access to that innovation and not stifle it through, you know, very stringent ownership of somebody's IP. Yeah, anything that you come with, will you'll have background IP that will totally be your entities. That's good. It'll stay with you. And it really sure. creates, it sounds like an opportunity for the free enterprise uh, system to generate new uh, new in enterprises and new uh, job opportunities would be the hope, I would think. Absolutely. Good. Yeah, I, I couldn't help but think back about uh, really what I, I also think is so critically important with economic development, it's relationships. And so what we're talking about, y'all discuss networks, it's so many people all of a sudden uh, coming across one another that maybe didn't know each other previously um, and, and ending up with... Uh, let's face it, deals or opportunities for them to integrate and work together and uh, and for there to be some synergy that's not been here before. And if that ends up benefiting health uh, and, and the region in the process, creating jobs um, and, and generating new enterprise and, and the revenues that accompany that, then that's huge for North Texas, uh, not to mention the whole United States. Any board members, any questions at all, please? Just feel free to raise your hand or, or speak up if we've got any. We've got a chance to, to ask three uh, critical members of this, uh, this whole program. Good, good morning. Hi, Stacy. Hi, how are y'all? Uh, uh, I'm Stacy Webb. I'm with EDA. We're under the U.S. Department of Commerce. And um, I'm an economic development representative, so I'm out there sort of in the field. Um, I serve the North. Uh, Central Texas area, and then all of Oklahoma. Um, this is a great presentation, very, very informative. In fact, I was kind of offline Googling some background information. And um, so uh, this is a, an incredible program. I'll certainly be sharing it. There are actually four EDRs in the state of Texas. So I'm going to be sending that information uh, to them. But I uh, wanted to ask, I know that the the sort of hub is, is here in, in Dallas and there's a concentration in Texas, but I also serve the state of Oklahoma. Is it appropriate for me to share information there? Stacy, yes. <laughs> so, <Good. laughs> so great to meet you. Um, I think in my past life, I did a lot of work in trying to uh, to work with the the North Texas synergies that get, existed again with the you know, bringing in the EDA Build Back Better because Oklahoma got some. And so there was just so much of this, this bio corridor energy that was going on. So I work yeah. very closely with the Oklahoma crew um, in the, their, um, their workforce development center and in the, in the site that they're putting together in Oklahoma City, uh, Echo Global, all of them. So please feel free and reference that Jenny sent you. Awesome. Very okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. There was a follow-up question from uh, from Ron Simmons about the, uh, just curious if there were non-disclosure agreements between the parties participating in some innovation in IP. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. I'll, I'll uh, take a stab at that. Um, there's, a, there's a non-disclosure, a, a fairly broad one in uh, the member agreement as you join. Uh, but as parties start to come together uh, to form teams to go after particular project work, um, then non-disclosures between network members, spoke members, et cetera, uh, are really up to those members themselves. And so um, we don't want to get in, in the pathway of that. Uh, but really, the, the, the maybe the most important non-disclosure portion for us is, is for members to understand that as information gets passed through us about capabilities um, that are not publicly available, so as, as you know, as, as submissions come through us that go to the government, that we don't share your information with others unless it's 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 known. But from a party to party, that would be happen. That would happen on a party to party basis. Excellent. I think most of us deal with NDAs uh, certainly almost on a weekly basis. So 
very familiar. So important. <laughs> yes, sir. No question. No question. Love the idea that Craig Hulse has raised and as Print has pointed out, uh, we'll take a look at it, that you guys, uh, with the work that you're doing and being uh, tucked in right here in our region, we may want to explore. We'll, we'll certainly do that, whether we could create a board position for an individual from ARPA-H, uh, because I think the link, the tie uh, is very important for this to be maintained and for us to, to work with you. So we'll, we'll be exploring that. Good, good idea, Craig. All right. Well, if there aren't any other comments or questions, um, we'll proceed with our the rest of our business, I guess, Print. Um, and certainly so grateful, um, Mike and, and Grayson and Jenny, to have you guys on today uh, and, and to share what you have. And I think we've got to continue to spread, spread the word uh, and, and take the data that we're going to get as you share the presentation and this recording with all of us, Print. We'll, uh, we'll all work on our, our side. Uh, the, the ball is truly in our court. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting us be a part of your meeting. Appreciate well, it. Glad. Appreciate your your work and presenting all that, preparing for it. Thank you. Bye bye. You. All right, and you're welcome to stay on if you want. We just got a few other items of business before we close up. Not a whole lot. Um, there are um, some board announcements that uh, that Pritz got, and. Uh, I think uh, last Monday she sent, uh, Print did send out some city and county economic development uh, professionals across the region an email related to this Texoma Semiconductor Tech Hub and the local policy considerations that relate to that. Uh, Print, I don't know if there's anything more that needs to be said. You pretty much were just saying, hey, read this email and uh, that you view this as an important opportunity. You want to address that at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people that if you did not receive an email from me last week, last Wednesday, regarding tech clubs and a policy consideration, if you're a city or county, please let me know. Um, you know, we depend on our COG regional directory and our distro list for context, but certainly there are folks that we may not have reached. So just uh, for your awareness, if you have not received a survey from me in the last week, just send me an email. Yeah, please, uh, please do make sure you respond to that or uh, give, give her some feedback for all of us to have. You know, it's, it's great to see uh, here another hub opportunity. Uh, we're going to we're going we're gonna, to no pun intended, really get rolling if we can get further each of these. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's going to benefit the region as a whole. Um, hey, Marty. Yes, please. Craig. Real quick, just to add to that. Uh, please. Print. You know, President Biden announced, I don't know when, a couple of years ago, that he was going to uh, dedicate $56 billion towards uh, grants to uh, uh, grow the, the semiconductor industry and, in you know, near shore it, have it in the States. So there's money out there from a federal standpoint um, that uh, our region can take advantage of in addition to the survey that, that Pritt's asking about. Good point, Craig. Thank you. Hey, Marty, it's Ron Simmons. Please. Uh, I would also, uh, and Rick, you might want to look into this as well. They, the legislature passed uh, a bill last session that puts restrictions, restrictions maybe not the right way, put some parameters around uh, county and city ordinances and policies. Uh, that may be in conflict with state, uh, what the state says. So I would just encourage everybody to take a look at that so you don't go down a road that would have to end up backtracking on. It probably doesn't have any effect on something like economic development and incentives uh, that your local areas may want to provide, but it's worth at least having your city attorney or county attorney. Good, good word, Ron. Um, and, and there were some other bills uh, that were introduced that did not get out of um, out of either the committee. May have, one, one got out of committee, but didn't hit the floor in the Senate. That does relate to incentives, specifically Chapter 380 related ones. And I think you're going to see that continue to be an issue. Um, I, I yeah, there's, yeah, that's a that's a big issue there. On it's just trying to figure out what the right balance is for those incentives. Well, and, and I would add maybe some opportunities for communication. Excuse me one second. Um, communication 
during this interim time before the legislature takes uh, their seats again with a couple of officials um, to uh, talk a little bit about why exactly we have incentives. And, and that may be a, a topic for a whole nother discussion. I know we don't really want to get into politics too much in this group and stick to policy, but I think that's going to be critically important that we help others understand what's been done with, uh, with Chapter 380 incentives, uh, why it plays into what, what some have tagged or called the Texas miracle, and, that, and the fact that it does take place in cities and counties. Uh, and, and so that certainly I welcome that discussion either offline or, or maybe at another meeting if we need to. Ron, you're going to speak up. Go ahead. No, I just think that's right. I mean, I think it's a, it's a challenge within the legislature um, as, you know, they call it picking senators and losers. Uh, when I was there, I, I quickly understood that it's really just about, really not as much about um, our internal competition as it is about our external competition outside the state of providing incentives that makes us as attractive as any other state, or in, in some cases, country, as if we're a border state. Uh, and, and that's a, a whole communication thing that uh, really has, we have to do a better job at communicating with the legislators on that issue so that they can't get caught up in this, where the groups are trying to say it's picking winners. That's my opinion, I guess that sometimes can be the case, but uh, it's about keeping Texas. Yes, sir. And there, there was, uh, fortunately, we have 407 now, which word is coming out about all that, by the way, that the state took action. Um, but but some other states took pot shots at Texas uh, between that time. And so, uh, yeah, we've, we've got we've got a lot of communicating to do, not just not just within our region and within the state, but but uh, beyond. So. Uh, Certainly, if that's something we want to talk about at some point, we can add that to the agenda if we'd like. Feel free and let Pritt know if that's something that's on your list. Um, there's a couple of things to make mention before I hand the ball over to Pritt with some Economic Development District updates real briefly. Uh, if, in case you aren't aware, a number of us were on with him early. I don't know if he stayed on. But uh, today, David Schleg's last day with the city of Dallas is tomorrow. David, are you still with us? Did you hop off? He may have left. Um, Still here. Yeah, oh, you're here. Yeah. Show everybody yes, your scepter that you've been oh. presented. Uh, you know, Dallas, they uh, they recognize the importance of economic development and, and made sure and did a tip of the hat to, to David and the work that he's doing. David, all the best to you and certainly safe travels north up into Portland. And be careful as you go through California, as you talked about, if that's, yeah. if that's something you head into this week. All the best to you. God bless you. Thanks for your service on this this board. OK, thank you so much, guys. Anybody else? Um, I've, I've traded notes with a couple of you. You know, a couple of you know. I'm. This will be um, my last board meeting with you in this position. Uh, there are some open seats to come, but uh, I, I guess I need to officially uh, resign as I'm. I'm going to be uh, leaving to go to another city here on uh, February the 20th, and uh, we'll we'll report to the Arlington Economic Development Corporation to to work with that entity, and I'm very thrilled. And uh, as uh, Marianne Moon and I were exchanging in, in the messages, there's, there's a lot of a lot of churn. There's a lot of individuals that are that are moving uh, or, or changing places at the moment. And so certainly I know Pritz, that just makes Pritz job uh, that much tougher to make sure and, and Jerry's to make sure this board uh, continues to be populated with the individual so we can go forward. And as we heard today with ARPA H and and uh, uh, certainly as well, the uh, the stuff associated with Texoma. Uh, there's plenty of work to be done. So um, I, I'm grateful for all of you for, for the work that you're, you do uh, take part in here with this board. Let's, uh, let's, let us let's me hand it over to Pritt, and if you could give us just your update on the district. Uh, we're, we may end up a little, little early today before we talk about that virtual meeting to come in May. Yeah, I think this is the first time we haven't gone past 1130, just a minute or two, which is interesting. Yeah. But um, a lot of the updates I wanted to talk about, I don't have a ton of kind of came up in conversation, but um, Again, if you didn't receive that survey that uh, Marty mentioned, um, please let me know. And thank you all for talking about you know, how there might be some impacts, obviously, to what folks can do. The survey really is not a commitment to anything. It's just a consideration, uh, something to consider uh, a, a year or two down the road. More than anything, I think the ARP age presentation was just uh, timing-wise perfect. I just wanted to let you all 
know that the Texoma Semiconductor, te Semiconductor Tech Hub that Dr. Nair did a presentation to last, last November to the board um, is moving along. Um, they are working hard. I can tell you all of us 10, 11, 12 hours a day because the NOFO for this phase two tech hub was released at the end of November and applications are due at the end of February. And obviously we had some holidays in between there, but a lot of work is being done in the same vein of what was talked about at ARPA H today, consortiums, coalition, regionalism, which is making huge impact regardless of the level of involvement in a city or a county or any other organization may have. So just wanted to let you know that that work is being done. Um, that those applications will be mit, submitted in February and we may have an update for you a little bit in, at the May meeting. We also have um, uh, our presentation on the for the May 6th meeting will likely work, uh, focus on workforce. So I'll have more details on that to send to you soon. Um, and honestly, those are the two biggest updates. Marty, thank you so much for chairing this board and, and being such a great leader for all of us. And I look forward to working with you in a new capacity. Thank you. Brit, it's an honor. Uh, a number of you know I've got to. I, I've been blessed early in my career to work for Tom Vandergriff, the the man that founded Cog uh, here in North Texas, and then with Bill Pitstick too, uh, the original executive director. So um, I, I view it as a chance. Bill Pitstick was first city manager of Arlington, and came back to form Cog. I worked with the Arlington Chamber and, and did economic development on contract for the city way, way back. Man, I'm an old man, 89 in the early 90s, and then now I'm getting the chance to, to go full circle and go home. So I'm I'm truly a blessed man. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly, any comments or questions for the board or anything that we have for future items? Do you have um, do you have anything related to what you have heard uh, uh, Ron Simmons point out? Anybody else? If you feel like that needs to be an issue we need to address, let Pritt know if you would, please. Okay. And I appreciate the number of you sent, sent kind kind notes in the, in the uh, chat. Thank you. You're very kind. Uh, love working with each of you. Hey, Marty, I'll just add, if, if it's not a board meeting, we can always schedule a webinar on these topics that, you know, that are important to the board. Yeah, I, I think it might be wise. Uh, again, I want to be very delicate because we do work with cities but uh, and, and counties and, and other uh, entities that are jurisdictions of the state. But I, uh, I've had it hard on my heart to, to meet with a couple of uh, state senators in particular. And I think it might make sense for us to talk a little bit about all that. So if that's something you share interest in, let Pritt know, please. Any new business before we adjourn? I appreciate you all. I appreciate your service. Um, let's let's uh, people support what they help create, as I heard it. Uh, as an undergrad at UTA, let's take that to heart when we think about ARPA-H and we think about the, the Texoma initiative uh, that, that we've got opportunity to plug in ourselves and other people we associate with to help make this uh, the best for our region. So, okay. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.